Well, good evening, and uh, uh, reiterating uh, uh, Andrew's uh, uh, welcome to uh, all of you. Uh, the fact that as many of you have uh, come here as you can, I think, is uh, appropriate uh, testimony for uh, the prestige of our uh, guest speaker tonight, uh, Professor David Shambach from George Washington University. Uh, David is, uh, I, I think, uh, universally acknowledged uh, as one of the uh, premier uh, China analysts uh, in, in the world today. Uh, currently, of course, a professor at uh, the George uh, Washington University um, Elite School uh, in Washington, D.C., uh, but has um, uh, really been a recognized international authority uh, on China and international relations uh, uh, for, for many, many years. Uh, although he looks actually quite young, I better than that say. And uh, uh, he, uh, of course, uh, before joining uh, the faculty of uh, uh, GW, uh, taught at the University of London uh, School of Oriental African Studies. He was also the editor of the China Quarterly, uh, which is the world's leading scholarly journal of uh, contemporary China studies, uh, perhaps apart from our own, the China Journal, because I know there are two people who wrote tonight. So, so one of the two uh, most prestigious journals. Um, uh, David served as the director of the Asia program at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, uh, as a panelist for the Department of State Bureau of Intelligence and Research, and the National Security Council. Uh, he's also been a non-resident senior fellow in the Foreign Policy Studies program at the Brookings Institution. Uh, he's received numerous grants, too many to, uh, to, to cite to every one of them here. Uh, just to say that he's been a fellow at the Woodrow Wilson uh, International Center for Scholars, a senior Fulbright Research Scholar at the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences Institute of World Economics and Politics, uh, and a visiting scholar at different uh, intervals uh, in China, Germany, Japan, Hong Kong, Russia, Singapore, and Taiwan. Uh, he's had a number of consultancies uh, with the U.S. government, the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, the Rand Corporation, and numerous private sector uh, corporations, and serves on a variety of different editorial boards, including probably the most prestigious journal in uh, the international security uh, field of academics, uh, the, the Journal of International Security. In fact, he's uh, spearheaded uh, uh, many of the best uh, authors uh, of that journal over the last uh, few years. Uh, he received his PhD uh, in political science from the University of Michigan, uh, an MA in international affairs from Johns Hopkins University, um, Paul Nitz's school, uh, or SICE, and a, and a BA in East Asian Studies from the Elliott School, uh, where, of course, he is now a professor. Um, tonight, David's going to talk to us about his latest book, um, China Goes Global. Um, and uh, uh, just very brief synopsis, David's asking an outline. Uh, he essentially delivers a book that uh, uh, is a comprehensive account of uh, China's growing prominence on the international stage. Um, and he charts through, if you will, China's expanding economic power and how that uh, economic acumen has allowed it to extend its reach virtually everywhere, uh, both within the Asia Pacific region and in uh, the broader world. Um, but gives uh, an interesting label, assigns an interesting label uh, to understanding China as a uh, international relations actor, what he terms a partial power, and he'll, I'm sure, go into that to some extent uh, in his presentation. Look, I think uh, uh, that probably uh, gives you at least a snapshot uh, in terms of uh, the uh, fantastic number of accomplishments uh, that David has um, um, uh, to his name over the past uh, uh, years and uh, decades, and uh, it is just an absolute pleasure uh, uh, to uh, introduce uh, Professor uh, David Shinlaw. David. Well, thank you, Bill, very much for that uh, quite a little generous introduction. But I'm very pleased for, to have you uh, introduce me, uh, as our personal friendship and professional relationship goes back to a sting uh, this afternoon, actually, as I was jogging around the lake. Uh, it goes back almost 30 years. So, uh, Bill is one of America's greatest exports and one of the greatest investments in the Australian American alliance. I think. Um, so, it's always a pleasure to see you, and I want to begin by thanking you 
Uh, Dr. Martin, Dean McIntyre, I don't know if Paul Hutchcroft is here this evening or not. Way up in the corner. Paul, thank you, all four of you, for inviting me down under uh, for this really wonderful two week uh, visit to the ANU. I'm really enjoying myself, I have to say. Um, and I'm uh, on this occasion, as in previous visits, very much impressed by the faculty and the students who have been uh, interacting. Um, and you've got a really wonderful uh, constellation of expertise on, on Asia, in particular, and international relations in China. So it's really fun. And John Hunter and Nino, very nice to see you again, too. I should have, should have mentioned that. Old friends. So um, it's a real pleasure to talk a little bit. It's a pleasure and a little bit uh, nervous. This is the first time I've spoken publicly about this new book, which is not yet out. It will be published in December uh, by Oxford University Press. Um, and I'm just now putting the kind of finishing touches on the manuscript. We have a, this is a book that has a cover already. It's even got some endorsements. But the manuscript is still in its sort of final, final stages of, of finish, finishing, shall we say. So you might think of this evening as kind of a pre, like a pre-screening of a film, but the final edits and cuts are still uh, to be done. But um, when uh, I was asked to do a public lecture as part of this visit to the ANU, I thought, right, David, the book's done. It's time for you to kind of go public with it, with your findings. So this is a first time I've actually spoken about it publicly. So um, I'm going to try and give you uh, a kind of summary of a pretty bulky book, I dare say, um, 150,000 word volume. So, but reasonably priced. <laughs> in paperback, no less. So, um, well, I need not uh, tell you that China is uh, the world's kind of most important rising power uh, by many measures. Uh, it's clearly um, the world's second uh, leading power after the United States. And its aggregate economy is, depending on which analysis you read, due to uh, catch up with and even surpass in aggregate uh, the U.S. around sometime around 2025. 20, um, over the last two decades, we can say that China has moved from the periphery to the real core of the international system. Uh, and every day, you know, one picks up uh, or looks at the digital or uh, broadcast media and sees China uh, in a number of ways grabbing global attention, gobbling up natural resources around the world, and increasing share of global energy supplies, uh, continuing to be the, I think, the second largest recipient of foreign direct investment after the U.S., um, expanding its overseas footprint in many ways, which is what we're going to talk about tonight, uh, more recently asserting itself in the Asian neighborhood, uh, so-called assertive foreign policy of 2009 and 10. Um, being the sought-after uh, partner in global governance, um, sailing its navy quite literally into new oceans around the world, um, broadening its global media exposure and trying to um, and expanding its global cultural presence and, and gain so-called soft power, and uh, managing a mega economy that continues to be uh, one of uh, the engine of global. Growth. So in these ways and, and others, uh, China's global impact is being increasingly uh, felt uh, across the globe in virtually all international institutions. And Kent is here tonight, um, written a very fine book on that dimension, and on many global issues. Um, so that's not new news. China's rise is not new news any longer. Uh, it's been much discussed in the international relations literature and the international media for at least a decade and has resulted in a variety of studies in, over the last decade, some with some pretty fanciful titles, um, such as Martin Jacques' uh, recent book, When China Rules the World, The Rise of the Middle Kingdom and the End of the Western World. That's not a catchy title. <laughs> <laughs> and has sold a 3.5 million copies. I mean, trying to grow as global can sell 3.5 million copies. That would be very pleasing. <laughs> um, maybe I need a, a much, much more attractive title like um, uh, "When China Rules the World." Um, 
Actually, my book is going to be quite a counterpoint to Jacques' book. Um, but we've had James King's China Shakes the World, The Rise of a Hungry Nation, um, and other more sensationalist titles. Uh, I don't know if you get these books down under, but in the United States, they seem to come out every week. I came across one last month called Death by China. <laughs> uh, there's another. <laughs> and there was one published last fall called uh, Eclipse, Living in the Shadow of China's Dominance. Wow. Uh, even, even Hugh White and I have contributed to, to this, these, these uh, catchy titles and this uh, literature with books entitled Power Shift. Um, wonderful to see you tonight as well, Hugh. So, you know, one way or another, much of this writing has um, drawn attention to China's uh, increasing global role. And in the United States, much of the writing has foreseen a clash between um, the rising power of China and the established power of the United States, um, such as the case, for example, with another important recent book by Aaron Friedberg, um, at Princeton University called A Contest for Supremacy, China, America, and the Struggle for Mastery of Asia. So we have no shortage of studies analyzing China's rise uh, and predicting its discomforting impact on world affairs. So about six years ago, when I finished my last study on the Chinese Communist Party, um, I decided to turn my attention um, back to the uh, international dimension of China. I've always sort of my career straddled the two and gone back and forth between domestic and international studies. And I wanted to tackle this question of China's rise as well. But I wanted to do it somewhat differently. I didn't want to look at it just in terms of its rise, sort of vertically, and what that meant for the United States. But conceptually, I think of it more as a spread, kind of horizontal uh, spread. And I wanted to examine how China's activities and presence were spreading on a truly global basis um, and across a whole broad a series of, of indicators, not simply through the prism of diplomacy or, or strategy. So I wanted to look at the totality, or at least as close to the totality as I could get, um, uh, of, of China's global footprint, or footprints, I should say, and to really get a sense of uh, China's impact in many different spheres. My own thinking, I distinguish between foreign policy and foreign relations, and the policy being something that governments do. Uh, foreign relations are something that societies do. Um, and so I wanted to really uh, tackle the latter, to try and get a sense of the totality of China's uh, kind of social <coughs> impacts, economic impacts, normative impacts, and diplomatic and strategic. So that's what I've tried to do in this book. And I confess that when I started out, um, I assumed that China was having a big impact on the world, and that my job was basically to simply uh, explore and elaborate the dimensions of it. Um, kind of a hypothesis in search of confirming data, which any good social scientist would tell you is not the way to live research. But, um, in fact, surprisingly, and I'll give a sneak preview of the conclusions of the, of the book and the lecture tonight, the data did not confirm the hypothesis once I got into it. Um, so maybe that is good social science. Uh, I didn't find what I expected to find. So I don't want to overstate it, but, and there are some ex important exceptions to this rule, um, but I've found in this book that across various dimensions, China's um, global uh, influence uh, is very limited, repeat, very limited. Um, that's why I entitled the, the subtitle, I should say, the book, The Partial Power. Um, it's broad, but not particularly deep. And China, I argue, has a growing international presence, um, but is not very influential. I argue that China is a global actor without yet being a true global power. Um, the distinction being that true powers influence events. Merely having a global presence does not equal uh, having global power unless a nation influences events in a particular region or realm. Uh, shaping the desired, uh, the desired outcomes of a situation is the essence of influence and the exercise of power. So 
in this regard, I'm following, I guess, in the realist tradition, you know, maybe we'll go back to Morgan now, but most recently, Joseph Hyde's most recent book on uh, the future of power. In that book, Nye argues uh, also that resources uh, do not constitute power unless they're used to try and influence uh, the outcome of a situation. Um, they have to be used to be effective. So he argues, and I would agree, that wealth does not equal power, and power does not equal influence. Thus, the essence of power lies in the conversion of resources into influence, which is the exercise of power, if you follow me. Um, and so when I started looking at China in many different dimensions I'll talk about tonight, um, I find that it has a lot of wealth, um, it has some power, and has very little influence. I don't want to overstate that because there are some important exceptions. Global trade patterns, global energy and commodity markets, global tourism industry, actually, global sales of luxury goods. China has, Chinese consumers have rescued the international luxury good market in the last three years. And cyber hacking. These are the areas in which China are, is truly a global leader. Um, so, it, uh, you know, China is markedly influencing these trends in these areas, but other than these limited areas, I find that China doesn't really, I really argue, China doesn't really influence global events. So let me kind of walk you through the different dimensions of the book in the study, trying to elaborate this thesis, starting with diplomacy. Um, so I find uh, Chinese diplomacy actually to be remarkably passive, risk-averse, and guided by very narrow national interest. Um, sorry if there's someone here from the Chinese Embassy who's <laughs> offended by that statement, but um, one does not find, in my opinion, uh, Beijing proactively or positively trying to resolve any global problem. Um, even in the case of North Korea, the one area where we do give China, normally give China credit uh, for being deeply involved in a global problem, um, even in the case of North Korea, you know, China has been doing the six party talks. But the situation has now dragged on for years and years and years with the DPRK having developed a number of nuclear devices, an uh, increasing number of delivery systems, listed missiles, um, not to mention the aggressive behavior towards the South and the defiance of the international community. Where is Beijing's influence? You know, China is supposed, supposed to be one country with some influence over the North Koreans. Uh, you don't see it. Um, China has, I would argue, indulged, aided, and vetted Pyongyang and has done um, not much of anything to really resolve the dangerous situation on the Korean Peninsula. Why? Because of its own narrow national interests. <laughs> it doesn't want an implosion of that regime on its border. Now you can argue about whether that's a um, good thing or a bad thing, but uh, even in this one area, and we can go through talk a little bit more about global governance in a second, but we can go through the Iran issue, go through the Sudan issue, go through Zimbabwe, go through Denmark, go through a lot of pressing issues on the global agenda. You don't see China in the middle of them, and you don't see China actively involved in trying to resolve them um, in my view. You know, generally, China's diplomacy takes a kind of lowest common denominator approach, usually adopting the safest and least controversial uh, position possible, watering down sanctions or you know, massaging language in the UN Security Council or whatever. Uh, the notable exception being in China's asserted mar maritime territorial claims. There we see China uh, not taking the lowest common denominator approach. So I see Chinese diplomacy as relatively passive, as I say, risk averse. Don't want to get in the middle of things um, and don't seemingly want to solve problems. So they sit on the sideline. Um, they maintain a low profile, as Deng Xiaoping instructed 20 years ago. How long on the way? Maintain the low profile. Bide your time. Hide your brightness. Um, so I don't know if it's Deng Xiaoping's instructions of 20 years ago, or Beijing's long-standing discomfort with what they call power politics, or uh, its relative uncertainty and inexperience in world affairs. Um, or a combination of all the above, but whatever the case is, um, China demonstrates, in my view, a distinct indecision and inability 
to shape world events. Um, I also find Chinese diplomacy a kind of transactional approach. What, you know, what is China going to gain from any uh, investment of diplomatic effort? It's a very kind of cost-benefit approach, rather than thinking about contributing, solving a problem, or contributing to a public good. It's kind of a very, you know, it's like a sort of commercial approach to diplomacy. So I'm going to invest, I want to know when, when the payout comes and how the payout comes. Um, and one sees this in spades when it comes to global uh, governance issues. The whole notion of contributing to public goods, I would argue, if you're interested in what Anne and, and Kathy think on this, but I'd argue it's not something that China philosophically um, understands and believes in and grasps. Um, I find that its involvement in global governance is very hesitant, very skeptical, very minimalist, and very transactional. Um, these quotations from different Chinese uh, scholars in the white paper last year uh, give a sense of this, of this hesitancy and, and skepticism uh, and tactical approach to global governance. Right? Yeah, the second quotation I have from a scholar, multilateralism is a tool and a tactic for us, not an incoming governmental mechanism or institutional arrangement. Um, and they, the first one, you know, global governance is a Western concept. Uh, emphasize governance, we Chinese emphasize the global dimension. They care about being at the table rather than what is discussed at the table and actually doing things to achieve progress in international global governance issues. Um, so I find, you know, global governance, um, as I say, a great deal of risk aversion um, and skepticism. Uh, skepticism that grows out of um, their insecurities uh, in domestic political terms and their problems with the United States and the belief that the United States is always out to restrain China's rise in different ways. And I had, um, and, and global governance is one way they, many in China, both in and out of government, believe the U.S. is trying to restrain their rise. And one official told me a couple summers ago, pretty high level official actually, said, David, you Americans um, have been trying to restrain our rise uh, for 30 years. First, you tried to do it domestically um, by trying to uh, catalyze the demonstrations in the spring of 1989 to overthrow the Communist Party. That failed. Um, then, in the 1990s, uh, you tried to do it regionally through trying to contain us. That too has failed. Now, your latest tactic, he told me, is to bleed us internationally, out there in the international arena, get us involved in the so-called responsible stakeholder notion. It's just a trap. You, wanna, you say you want us to be a responsible stakeholder, but no, no, we know better. These are your wars and your uh, conflicts and your problems. They're not ours. And we're not going to fall for it. So there's a great deal of skepticism, but a mild disbelief um, and fear that this is just another way to uh, retard China's rise. Um, so there's there's a lot of, a lot of skepticism, but I should say that there are those in China who are advocates of uh, doing more in the international arena. Deng Xiaoping, in the same speech I just quoted, also said, uh, we have to do some things. Um, so some Chinese scholars would have labeled globalists and a selective multilateralists in a spectrum of um, thought in China's international relations community. Last time I was here two years ago, uh, I gave a lecture here in, in the Headley Bull Center on, on this topic, so I'm not going to give that lecture again tonight, but I want to remind you uh, of the essence of that lecture is that China is a very conflicted country about its international identity. It has many different international identities, seven of them, uh, in my view. And you know, just to briefly re recapitulate, you've got down here on the left-hand side uh, what I call the natives, very xenophobic, anti-Western um, sort of pundits who would like to close China's door. I never really believed in opening it in the first place. I think that it's resulted in corrosion of Chinese society, values, political system, and so on. 
um, very hyper-nationalist, very anti-American, very anti-Western group. Uh, then there's a group, they call it the Realists, which um, is in fact the kind of center of gravity in this spectrum. Um, these are the China firsters, build hard power. The world is, like Realists everywhere, I think the world's a predatory anarchic place, the only way to navigate the predatory anarchic environment is through um, strength and power. Uh, and then there's a more pragmatic group, I call the major powers group. They say we've got to manage our relations with the United States above all, the Russians, maybe the European Union, um, because they're very important to us for various reasons. Then there's an Asian first group that says, no, 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 we need to prioritize relations in our neighborhood. If we don't have those uh, rights, um, we will be spending excessively on national security issues and we won't be able to trade, the production chains will break down, all kinds of things will go wrong. So we've really got to emphasize Asia first. That uh, school, by the way, was the brainchild of the former ambassador here to Australia, Fu Ying, you may remember, um, who's now, guess what, vice foreign minister, but in charge of what? Asia. She's back. They put her back in charge of the Asia portfolio, trying to put back together the pieces after the 2009-10 assertive <coughs> period. Um, so we'll see if she can succeed. We're looking at the 2009-10 period of one year, 18 months really, undid 10 years of very good work on their, in their regional diplomacy. And then there's what I call the Global South School, which is really you know, about the RICs and redistribution of power and resources from north to south. Um, and then there are these globalists and selective multilaterals. So the point is, and I want to re-give that lecture I did last time, but the point is there are voices in China who at least, even though I think their voices have pretty well been eclipsed in the last few years, but they did advocate contributing to public goods and to global governance and being a responsible stakeholder. They're, they're a minority voice but they, they are there. Okay, so when one, so that's diplomacy. Um, when one looks at other dimensions of China's global posture, uh, one finds a similar pattern, I would argue, of breadth but not depth, presence but not influence. So let's look at three other dimensions. Uh, economic power, soft power, and hard power. Starting with economics, this is the one area where you would expect, and one does in fact find uh, China to possess uh, great power globally, certainly in terms of trade. Um, yeah, so these are China's major trading partners. We all know its impact. It's the world's largest trading power. Um, or should I say it's, the world's, uh, it's a trading state and it's very much followed the classic uh, developmental state model of Japan and South Korea, but married that together with the Soviet planned economy. Um, and has followed an export-led growth strategy over the last three decades, which many people in and out of China think has now kind of reached the end of its lifespan and rebalancing needs to take place. Um, but you don't find that taking place uh, in, in reality, only rhetorically. In fact, you find the allocation still very much favoring the state-owned sector, Building up a series of so-called national champions, the largest 110 state-owned enterprises, um, to so choo choo to go abroad. Uh, so, so when you look at the you know, in aggregate terms, China is indeed a uh, major trading uh, power. But if you look at the type of goods that China exports, they are far from being cutting edge. This gets immediately into the whole question of indigenous innovation. Um, global cutting edge developments in technology and products, I would argue, are not originating in China. Nor are they in the natural sciences, the medical sciences, the social sciences, or the humanities, or any other field. It's no accident that China has not won any Nobel Prizes in these fields. They have a uh, Nobel Prize for peace, we'll come to that later, but uh, <laughs> not to in, in these other fields. Innovation. It's a huge subject, and, um, but and China's worried about it, and they have this national program of indigenous innovation, classic kind of Chinese state developmental approach to 
creativity. They think they can, you know, do a top-down, fund it just like high-speed rail. We'll become an innovative society if we just throw enough money at it. Uh, you can't, that doesn't work that way. And I'm going to argue in a minute, the same thing applies to soft power. So, uh, trade, big trading state, you know, lots of goods flowing over these markets, but not cutting the edge. They're not setting the pace in global technologies. Um, the second aspect of China's global economic footprint, overseas direct investment and multinational corporations. Um, here, one also finds that China is not having much of any impact in time. China's ODI has a uh, minimum $60 billion last year. Actually declined in 2011 and 2010 from 68 to 60. That ranks China fifth in global terms. Um, but if you were to cut out the amount of investment that goes in Hong Kong and Macau, um, if you were to take that out, then uh, it shrinks to about $20 billion a year. So the, the Netherlands exports more capital than does China. And then if you look at the destinations, so, where is the money going? That's the question. And it's going uh, to uh, portfolio investment or simply parking money in offshore bank accounts and tax havens. <laughs> or money looking for from merger and acquisition opportunities. Very little of it is actually going into investment per se, so-called greenfield investment. And that which is, is going into natural resource extractive industries in the developing world, showing the insatiable appetite, China's insatiable energy appetite. So this uh, brings me uh, briefly, you notice know, Australia number five there, which is not a tax haven, this last time I heard. Um, so you're the first real country here that's, that's, that's receiving Chinese investment. And it proves the point. Where's it going? Natural resource extractive industries. Um, all right, so let me say a few words about China's multinational corporations, which is a new but fascinating topic to me. I've not previously worked on it before with this book. In fact, I have an article on it uh, coming out in the next issue of Peter Drysdale's East Asia Quarterly Forum. It should be out you know, any day or week. The ne next issue is devoted to Chinese overseas investment. Uh, so he yeah, approached me that somebody told him I'm working on Chinese multinationals. I don't know who did, but I agreed to do it. And so um, it's a fascinating topic. Um, just ask yourself, though, how many Chinese multinationals can you name? You can all um, I'll try to answer the question for you. Qingdao Beer, right? Air China, uh, Huawei Telecoms, um, High Air, uh, Light Goods, um, maybe Geely Automobiles, Leaning Sportswear. That's sort of where I went out. Uh, you know, can we even get to 10? No, we can't. Um, these are the ones that popped in my mind, anyway. And none of these, none of these are on the top 100 list of business interbrands, top global brands. Several of them are, however, on the global Fortune 500 list. Um, this year, China has 41 firms on the global Fortune 500 list. That's a doubling, in fact, in three years. 41 out of 500. In fact, I think the highest one ranks uh, 19 or something. Um, but how, do, how does Fortune rank their, uh, these firms? They're ranked by total revenue, not by uh, source of revenue. So if you, break, if you look at those firms, the 41 firms, which I've done, it won't take too much time, it turns out that with the exception of Huawei and Hire, all, all of them, and, and um, PetroChina, all of them derive their revenue predominantly domestically in China. They're not real, they're not multinational corporations, they're domestic corporations who are trying to go global, perhaps, but haven't done so yet. Um, they've got, Chinese multinationals have a very, very long way to go, I think, uh, to become really multinational firms. First, the first thing you've got to do is operate multinational. The second thing you've got to do is have multinational staff, foreign staff in your management structures. Um, you've got to have other things that 
multinationals have oversight boards, transparency, you know, sort of normal uh, attributes of, of multinationals, which the Chinese MNCs uh, do not have, say Huawei and CNUC, actually, the CNUC is another counterexample. Um, so there are some serious impediments, I think, holding back the development of Chinese multinational corporations, which if you want to talk about more, I'd be happy to go into in the uh, Q&A. So let's turn to uh, soft power, the economic power, the soft power, which is uh, another very interesting topic, um, one that the Chinese are absolutely fascinated with in recent years, one might say obsessed with. Um, what is it, first of all? How do you get it? Do we have it? If we don't have it, where can we, where can we get it? Can we buy it? Is there a kind of Walmart of international relations where we go down into the soft power section and, and buy a you know, kit, off-the-shelf kit, and have it? No, it doesn't work that way. Um, the whole obsession has come about for a couple of, of different reasons. The first is that um, around about 2006 7 the Chinese government uh, and think tanks um, decided that the so-called comprehensive power, Zongbo Wuli, they call it, which has always involved economic and military power, now should involve cultural power. And they began to explore, um, and this was triggered by what? By Joseph Nye and his book on soft power. It was translated into <coughs> Chinese in 2006, I believe. So this uh, stimulated the whole deliberation about whether we, China, have soft power. Do we need it? There was a lot of dismissiveness at first. Um, but then there came to be a recognition that their global image mattered, and that China's global image wasn't so good. This is the Pew um, Global Attitudes Poll, which comes out twice a year. This was 2011. You find China here in the middle. Basically positive views. That these are 24 countries, 24 um, uh, different countries and societies who are polled on views of each other. So, and themselves. If you, if you look, if you break this down, I look at China's own image of itself, it's 97 percent positive, very high. But if you look at everybody else, China's a middling, uh, it's a sort of middling position. But more importantly, the trend line. The brown line here in the center is China. This is the BBC poll. It looks at a similar number of countries, um, 14 actually, 14 countries during 2005 10. Very fine. But a general decline, pretty significant decline of almost 20 points, except for a brief spike in 2008 around the time of the Olympic Games, but a steady decline in China's global uh, image. Not good. And so this all of a sudden came to the attention of China's leadership. And they realized, well, we better do something about it. Image matters. And it's not just, you know, they finally realized it's not just the Western China threat theory that is biased and prejudiced and giving us a bad name, which they still believe. But uh, they needed to do more to promote their own culture, uh, both domestically and globally. So over the last five years, this is Hu Jintao at the 17th Party Congress. Which was the first time in a major document like that that soft power was referred to, Rob Shirley. And since then, over the last five years, a tremendous amount of attention and resources have been poured into um, trying to build China's uh, global cultural presence, uh, expanding China's global media presence, um, and exporting so called cultural products. Broad. It's a very interesting concept. Chinese will commodify anything. Um, when I first saw that term, I didn't mean by when sure. But um, films, you know, acrobatic troops, and there all this stuff is considered when I sure. um, And trying to uh, export a number of messages about China and about China's perspective on the world. A lot of institutions are involved in this effort. Uh, billions of, of RMB, the billions of dollars are being thrown at this. State Council Information Office, the Bush and Bot, is the kind of nerve center of this whole activity. A man named Wang Chun, who's the director of the Bush and Bot, very powerful individual. He's 
got his hand on all these funds for what they call Gui Wai Shenshan. They don't call this you know, promotion of soft power. They call it Gui Wai Shenshan, foreign propaganda work, um, which tells you right there bureaucratically where it's situated and conceptually where it's situated in China. <laughs> um, so, you know, the question of bond is the center of activity, but everybody else, foreign ministry, foreign affairs, Xinhua, CCTV, which is now gone global. They've set up studios in Washington, D.C., Nairobi. They, they're trying to emulate Al Jazeera. They've got 24-7 presence now on television. Uh, it's not bad. Actually, the stories are pretty good, but they don't report, you know, on China. The Washington Lai affair, not one second of coverage on CCTV International. <laughs> the whole world is talking about Washington Lai affair, but not the Chinese media. <laughs> China Radio International, China Daily, really big efforts, even here in, in Canberra, the hotel where I'm staying. Walk in my hotel room there, it's China Daily on the desk in the Hotel Dumont. Lobby, big staff at China Daily's, it happened by accident. Right? It's Chinese Embassy going around and putting these around hotels in the United States now you can buy them in newsstands right next to the New York Times on the streets of Washington, New York. And its content, more importantly, uh, is really improved. China Daily's kind of readable newspaper. <laughs> a lot of information, particularly on China's overseas investment, uh, you can get from China Daily. And then a lot of other things. So, well, these are what I call the messengers. But my, what I'd like to submit to you is that no matter how much money you throw at the messengers, if your message isn't sellable, you're not, you're not going to be able to sell it. And China has a real problem with, first, the lack of persuasive messages abroad. They have a tendency towards propaganda, what they call Koha slogans, which don't translate very well at all. A few, if any, Chinese elements of Chinese culture really have universal appeal. Um, and thirdly, uh, their political system is, as Joseph and I will tell you, a country's political system is a major element of a country's soft power. Well, this is the Achilles, China's political system is the Achilles heel of China's soft power. The empty chair of Liu Xiaohua, one Nobel Prize winner um, in Oslo. Why? Because those of you who don't know Liu Xiaohua, he's serving an 11 year prison sentence in Liaoning province for subversion of state power. Unquote. So, in short, I find China's soft power being very soft, uh, at least according to Nye's um, definitions. These are Nye's definitions. Uh, so, what about hard power? Let me just uh, finish with that. I'm happy to talk about any of these topics in greater, greater depth. Um, the military power. Um, I would argue, and I've worked a fair amount on that in my career, China's a regional military power at best, and even regionally. Um, I'm not even sure I'd call China a regional military power. Uh, you would, maybe, others would. But when you think about China's military, it's not able to project power uh, more than 300 nautical miles from the shoreline. Project and sustain, I guess that's another key definition. To sustain power in a high, uh, high operations tempo environment, if you're going to prosecute a conflict, you've got to have 24 7 high op tempo, they call it. Um, so, China can do that in, in what they call the near seas, the inside the first island, maybe out to the first island chain. And their immediate littoral, their naval capacity in particular, but not necessarily their air capacity. Their in-flight refuel capacity is not proven, not very well proven. We know they can do it, but uh, you don't see them running 24-7 air cover over the South China Sea, for example had real in-flight refueling capacity, they would, I would imagine. Um, so even within Asia, I find that the PLA doesn't, well, has a naval power projected presence within Asia. Air <coughs> and the ground, you can't, you can't transport uh, forces, couldn't really project 
power and sustain it, as I say, um, beyond the first island chain. Um, so it just, and, and then if you look further away, with the exception, important exception, the Gulf of Aden um, and piracy operation, where, which is a good contribution to global governance, China should get credit for it, and they have now been deployed there for over a year, year and a half maybe. Um, that's uh, an accomplishment, um, but it's been stressing the Navy, I'm told, uh, to do that. So, um, don't get me wrong, the PLA, People's Liberation Army, has come a very long way over the last 20 years. Uh, it's been a beneficiary of tremendous resources, tremendous assistance from Russia, uh, and they finally got their own defense industries turned around, which have been the Achilles heel of China's own military modernization efforts. But that, they've done a number of things to um, improve that. And so they're now producing their own weapons of fairly good quality, and they have to, because they are cut off, I would remind you, from the international arms market. The Americans and the Europeans and the Australians and the Japanese and everybody else who manufactures advanced weapons, except the Russia. But even the Russians, interestingly, if you look at their sales, transfers and sales of weapons to China, they've declined precipitously since 2008. They peaked at $3 billion per year throughout the decade of the, of the 2000s. But since 2008, they've fallen to $1 billion or below. Why? A number of reasons for it, um, including Russian discontent with the Chinese copying the cloning of what they had sold um, to China. Um, the contracts had actually run to the end of their uh, cycles. There were a big debate in Moscow about the wisdom of arming uh, China. And you know, when the Soviet Union dissolved, they had that debate too, but they needed the money to keep the Russian defense industries alive to China really save them. But now, Russia's got other markets Many are arguing we should not be arming the Chinese. So even the Russians have now, they haven't cut them off, but they've uh, reduced significantly their arms sales to China. So China has had to do their own military modernization indigenously. And they've made a lot of progress. <laughs> there are three quick areas, three, I should have said this at the end. There are three important exceptions to the China's military is not so scary argument that I'm trying to make. <laughs> um, ballistic missiles space and cyber. Those are three areas that China does indeed have global reach. The old American AT&T has a reach out and touch zone. Well, Chinese ballistic missiles, cyber capacity, and increasingly space program can reach out and touch someone. Um, and they're, you know, these are important ex areas of exception. Um, cyber in particular, uh, very dangerous and causing a lot of problems in this country and our country and uh, globally. So, um, but China's a long way from being a global military power. That's kind of my bottom line. Okay, in conclusion, let me try and wrap, wrap this up, Bill. We can have some discussion. Where does this lead us? So China's definitely a rising power. It's also a spreading power. Um, footprint is pretty broad, you know, and they're, they're now present on every continent and in most every realm. Uh, but I argue in the book, it's more breadth than depth, hence I call it partial power. Um, and when you look at all four of these areas, I think one finds significant weaknesses with that, not strengths. Now over time, uh, that's going to change, um, no doubt, in some of these areas, particularly uh, the economic uh, domain. Uh, Chinese, Chinese companies are going to uh, become more multinational, are going to become more competitive in various realms. Their brands are going to start showing up on the Business Week list. There will be more companies on the Fortune 500 uh, list. Um, we may see their military, you know, a string of pearls strategy, may, a string of pearls may become a strategic reality, um, perhaps. Uh, we will see their Navy continue to sail further and further into the Pacific and Indian Ocean and beyond. Diplomatically, uh, we may well see a more proactive and even assertive China. To be sure, there are certainly voices in China, um, Chinese society, uh, that argue for a much more robust and assertive Chinese diplomacy, particularly towards the United States, and particularly over the so-called core interests 
blue stuff Chinese Sea. Um, so we may see a more assertive Chinese diplomacy. And in culture and soft power, all this investment may pay some dividends. But frankly, I'm dubious. I don't think you can buy soft power. Um, soft power, I've always thought of as kind of like a magnet. You know, people are attracted to you for your intrinsic value. The society's intrinsic value. It's not government. But what's happening here is the soft power promotion by China. It's all government directed. Um, <laughs> I had a, uh, a two-hour interview with this man, Long Chun, the State Council of Information Office director, about all of their efforts. And at the end of the two hours, his two-hour monologue, which is why I took lots of notes. Finally, at the very end, he said, well, tell me, Professor Chen, what, what do you think we should do to promote our soft power? And after sitting and listening to this for two hours, I probably shouldn't have said this, but I said, well, just get out of your own people's way. <laughs> you have a very creative, dynamic society. Just let them breathe and express themselves abroad. <laughs> Domestically first, but then abroad. And you can see kind of cognitive dissonance in his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's their power. They don't trust their own people. You don't trust your own people. And you have people like Leo Chabot doing 11 year prison sentences. You're not going to get some power. So, many over time, Chinese uh, analysts of Chinese foreign policy have long argued that China has compensated for its strategic weaknesses. It's always, quote, punched above its weight. Um, I argue in this book, China punches well below its weight. Um, it's going to change over time in each of these four categories, but uh, in 2012, I would argue that China, I'll just conclude, I argue that China is a middle power, a long way behind the United States in all of these categories. Um, so we live in a world of what the Chinese like to call one superpower, the United States, and many other powers. we we'll put China in the second category. Um, and it's got a long way to go before it really achieves the global military presence, the global soft power presence, uh, investment, and, and, and diplomatically, um, before it becomes a responsible stakeholder. So Robert Zellick's question, I would answer, not yet. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll stop there, and thank you for your attention. Be happy to take your questions.